So how do we balance food production, emissions reduction, biodiversity and livelihoods on peatlands? Should we be even trying to balance all of these and how do we move forward? So our speaker today is Heiko Balstar, a professor of physical geography and director of the Institute for Environmental Futures at the University of Leicester. Heiko also co-leads the newly formed Land Use for Net Zero Hub, um, a six million pound UKRI funded research consortium that's going to be looking at how we manage agricultural land and peatlands in the UK for emissions reductions. So last year, um, and Heiko is obviously going to be talking about this, Heiko was also our AFN Network Plus champion. And as part of that, he convened 40 researchers and peatland farmers in the East Anglian Fens, an area that accounts for around 27% of England's total peatland and a nationally significant area for vegetable and salad production. So Heiko is going to be sharing his findings from his research with us. Um, and we'll post a link to Heiko's research in the chat shortly, or Neil will do that in a second if he's not already. Um, if you've got any questions for him as we go along, please do write them in the Q&A panel, and we'll have about 30 minutes at the end for questions. Feel free to use the chat for discussion and sharing any relevant links as well. But if you can stick to keeping your questions for Heiko in the Q&A, then we can, we can find them quite easily like that. So we're obviously recording the session, um, and we'll be putting it on YouTube later on for others to see. So if you don't want to be identified as participating for any reason, probably best not to ask a question or do so anonymously. So I think Heiko, that's that's me done. Over to you now. If you're able to share your slides, that'd be great. Thank you very much, Jess, for the introduction. Let me just share my screen. So we should be in presentation mode now. Um, I hope you can see my slides. Okay, thank you first of all for inviting me to give this webinar today um, on the peatland dilemma. Um, should we continue to cultivate it? If so, how? It's on everybody's mind and it's all over the media. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty around the future of farming subsidies following the exit from the European Union and the common agricultural policy and the whole raft of new measures of policy instruments that is being experimented with um, in uh, England and also in the devolved administrations. So I'm going to share the outcome of an expert workshop with you um, in a minute. But before I do that, I want to briefly highlight the overall issue. This chart shows you the total UK greenhouse gas emissions weighted by the global warming potential by sector. And what we see here, the different colors are the different sectors. And the more recent data, this goes up to 2021, um, show that basically energy is the biggest sector of greenhouse gas emissions. So the energy usage actually creates the biggest footprint on the climate from the whole UK national inventory. And this is followed by industrial processes, but also the second biggest emitter is the agriculture sector. Um, land use, land use change and forestry, or LULUCF uh, is the acronym, is almost carbon neutral, although that is not quite the case anymore, I believe, in the more recent numbers. Um, and then there are some emissions from waste, from landfill primarily in green. Now, what we can see here since 1990, the UK has actually made quite a good progress in reducing the overall net greenhouse gas emissions uh, down. But overall, um, we still have some way to go to become carbon neutral to get to net zero, in other words, um, where the net emissions would become um, zero. So let me just highlight in, in that context what the peatland dilemma essentially is. This photograph we took in, um, in the fence actually in East Anglia, and it shows just a typical soil profile of the peatland there where you see the layer of peat, the really black and very rich soil at the top of um, the soil profile, and then the lower soil horizons <laughs> become then the mineral soil, um, quite often clay. Um, that's not very fertile, so the fertile soil is actually the peat layer on top. So agricultural peatlands are the most productive soils in the UK, they're, they're class one um, agricultural land actually, and they are used for the cultivation of many food crops especially vegetables and potatoes. So those soils are really, really important for food security in the UK. 
the peatlands have largely been drained historically. <laughs> so the historical drainage of peat started in the 17th century in England. And that has actually made the peat soil dry enough to be used for agricultural production. But that has resulted in significant greenhouse gas emissions from the mineralization and decomposition of the peat. How can we reduce the harmful greenhouse gas emissions whilst maintaining food security and rural economies? That's the key question we were trying to answer um, or move towards answering in this workshop we had about a year ago. So in March 2023, we got um, a number of experts together in the agri food for net zero network plus in at that time I was one of the champions in that network so um, I've been spending my time looking into this with my colleagues. And we've been trying to gather the best available evidence to answer that question. We were looking at possible alternative land management systems for agricultural peatlands um, in the search for finding future types of land use. The expert workshop report you can find in the chat <clears throat> and um, the, uh, it, the report is published in an online journal called Sustainability, published by MDPI, um, and it's called The State of Knowledge on UK Agricultural Peatlands for Food Production and the Net Zero Transition. Um, so you can download it and read it in full. Um, if you just Google for it, you'll find it or follow the link in the chat. The situation in the UK is that we have about 3 million hectares of peatlands altogether, and of this about half, half a million hectares almost are lowland peatland, as opposed to the upland uh, peat box, um, and of that half a million hectares, about a quarter of a million, so again half of the half um, a million hectares are used for agriculture. And those are um, areas of lowland peat that are primarily situated in the Fens, in the Norfolk Broads, in the Humberhead Levels, the northwest of England, and in the Somerset Levels. In the photographs you see here, this is just um, a field in the Fens on peat soil. So you see the dark soil here, very productive. Um, this was a crop of leek um, that was grown here. And it shows um, partly that um, there is quite a lot of crops still left in the field. So at harvest time, as the farmers amongst you will probably know, you harvest the best of the crop, but sometimes there's still quite a lot left over. And in fact, just looking at um, this field after harvest, you know, we could have picked a lot of leeks there, you know, and made some quite delicious dinners out of those. So there's still a lot of crop left over, and that might be one of the things we could discuss later on as a possible way of improving <laughs> the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from those systems. The fens, which I'm going to focus on primarily in this talk, are home to about half of England's highest value agricultural land. So therefore, they are really important for the productivity and food security of England's rural economy. And they provide 37% of England's vegetables. Um, the fens also provide social and economic benefits including 4,000 farms located in the fence, providing employment to 80,000 people, roughly. Um, so not to be underestimated. Now, the trouble starts when we look at what's going on in a drained peatland. So the peatlands have been drained, as I said, since the 17th century, but the drainage has really taken an industrial scale, maybe in the um, 18th, 19th century when some Dutch engineers were brought over to actually help accelerate that drainage. And at that time, um, the peat started oxidizing. So a wet peat, uh, where the peat soil is underwater, basically does not have any air in it. And therefore, there's no oxygen in the soil. And the peat is essentially emitting methane from bacteria and from microbes that are not relying on oxygen, but that live in waterlogged soils. Methane is also a powerful greenhouse gas, so it's not desirable to flood the whole place um, from a purely greenhouse gas uh, perspective either. So the drained peat soils with the bacteria and fungi starting to decompose the peat basically 
turn the carbon in the peat into carbon dioxide, which is a gas, and the gas escapes into the atmosphere and contributes to the climate crisis that we are currently all experiencing in terms of the impacts of the climate change on extreme weather um, in the UK and other, other parts of the world. The result of this is an, an emission of carbon dioxide and peat wastage at the same time. So the peat is starting to shrink. And um, I've been living close to that area in St. Ives in Cambridgeshire for a long time. So I've seen a lot of the areas in the fence um, firsthand on a number of occasions, also for weekend trips and things like this. And it's a fantastically beautiful area, I should say. So for those of you who haven't been yet, I really recommend you go and visit. Um, and one of the things that you notice is that actually quite often, as in this photograph, the drainage ditches are located higher up than the fields are. And that is because actually the drainage has meant the water has to be pumped up to a higher level to be then pumped out into the sea. So without the pumping systems and the drainage systems, um, the fens and large parts of East Anglia, in fact, would still be a swamp as they were in the 16th century before the drainage started. Um, the peat oxidation actually means that the peat is decomposing and shrinking. So there is less and less of that rich, dark soil on top of the peatland farmland. And that is a problem in itself because we are seeing in some areas now that we are getting close to the mineral soil underneath the peat, which really renders agricultural production impossible. Now, one can argue how long the peat is taking to be fully oxidized and lost, but whether it's 50 years or 70 or 100, um, it is not an unimaginably long time horizon for that to happen. That is the problem of the drained peat. So this is how the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide gets into the atmosphere from drained peatland. Emissions associated with agriculture. So over 70% of peatlands show on the ground degradation of the peat. Um, almost a quarter of our deep peat area is cultivated, including almost 60% of our lowland fen peat. Croplands on peat emit a total of about 39 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare per year. So carbon dioxide equivalent takes into account nitrous oxide, methane, and some other greenhouse gas emissions and converts that into equivalents of carbon dioxide based on their global warming potential because they have different effects on the climate. So 39 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent for each hectare of land for each year of cultivation. These numbers come from the England Peat Action Plan, um, Office for National Statistics and from a paper by Chris Evans in 2017. So in terms of how much we know about the carbon emissions, we can measure the emissions of carbon dioxide with this technology that I'm showing here on the screen. And this is an eddy covariance flux tower. Um, we see some examples of that instrumentation here. There are two photographs of different tower installations. And eddy covariance flux towers essentially measure what's called the net ecosystem exchange. So that is the amount of carbon dioxide that is passing by the sensor. The sensor looks a bit like these three metal fingers that are facing up and down. And the air that passes in between those basically is analyzed for the carbon dioxide content. And you can see whether the air is flowing up or down. And you can measure how much carbon dioxide is in it. And that gives you an estimate of the emissions or of the uptake of carbon dioxide. There are some uncertainties related to those measurements. So the wind direction, the wind speed can change. That means your emissions might be coming from a slightly different area depending on the wind direction. Uh, but overall, this is quite a reliable technique and there are various ways of correcting for some of the uncertainties in the measurement techniques. So in terms of the peatland carbon cycle, the top graph here shows a wet peat. So here we have the anoxic layer. So this, this is the wet layer, the waterlogged layer. The deeper layer of the peat here is completely saturated in water. The water is very close to the surface. The water table depth is quite small. Um, and the oxic layer where we have oxygen 
um, or air coming in is quite a thin layer. In those peatland conditions, the peatland emits quite a lot of methane, CH4, and it is taking up some carbon dioxide from the air through the plant growth and stores that in the soil. If we drain the peatland, as has been the case to make the peatland usable for agriculture, the oxic layer is a lot deeper because you have to make the soil dry enough to go onto it with agricultural machinery. And so this could be a meter, uh, maybe below the surface. And the anoxic layer is quite low down. So the water table depth is higher. Um, and <clears throat> what this means is we get more carbon dioxide emissions from the oxidation of the peat. And the only methane emissions we get from these types of soil actually come from the drainage ditches where we still have wet peat. These photographs show some of the team from Leicester University. So we've been working on these edicovariance towers since about 2009, when uh, uh, this photograph on the left is my colleague, um, Jörg Kaduk, who is installing some equipment here in the field um, to start measuring um, the carbon dioxide fluxes in the fence. And this is a younger version of myself in 2012, setting up the site for another field station measurement. Um, also on this rich peat soil. So we have some years of data now going back and, and what we find is basically is confirming largely those numbers. If anything, I think the emissions have been higher than we were expecting. So what options have we got to move forward? We need to carry on farming, we need to carry on producing food, but we also need to do something about the greenhouse gas emissions. There is the option to rewet the area of drained peatlands. Complete rewetting of agricultural peatlands may be required to move towards genuinely net zero landscapes. But this would mean an end to agricultural food production in the region. So this would clearly have significant negative economic and social implications for local communities and for food self-sufficiency in the UK overall. Therefore, this is not a desirable policy solution in my view. There is also the risk of displacement of greenhouse gas emissions from higher food imports that we need to compensate for the loss of our domestic production. So that needs to be factored in. And therefore, I don't think this is a sustainable solution. Complete rewetting, I don't think is what I would advocate for. There is an option of partial rewetting. Partial rewetting means that we would involve continuing uh, current farming with higher water levels and or with seasonal water level management with some areas dedicated to complete restoration. So this could, for example, mean on the very deep peat, we might choose some areas where we want to say, okay, we will revet those areas and turn them into conservation areas and wetlands. But there might be some other areas where we say, um, we could maybe raise the water table in winter to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in winter when the fields are not being used, when they're fallow, or we are thinking about raising the water table maybe by something like 10 centimeters, but not by 80 or 90 centimeters. The Climate Change Committee by the House of Commons actually um, recommended that 25% of lowland peat should be fully restored <clears throat> while transitioning towards sustainable land management or wetter management practices on the remaining 75% of cropland on peat and rewetting 50% of grassland on peat by 2050. So grassland is easier to rewet in a way because you don't have to go on it with the same heavy machinery um, quite so often, as is the case for crops. Raising the average water table from hmm. about 100 centimeters or a meter below the surface to 90 centimeters, so only by about 10 centimeters, could already reduce the carbon emissions by three tons of carbon dioxide equivalent for each hectare of land for each year. So that would make a start. We don't have to completely rewet the peatland to make a positive impact. And between 23 and 42 percent of carbon dioxide emissions on these fields occur between October and March, and so outside of the main cropping season. So raising the water table in the winter could mitigate emissions. 
That's the partial revetting option. And the government has studied paludiculture as a possible option. So some of you will be familiar with this. There is now a five million pound fund called the Paludiculture Exploration Fund. And paludiculture is essentially agriculture on wet soil. This aims to promote the use of peatlands for sustainable farming by overcoming barriers to commercial paludiculture. Because we have drained the peatlands, in the UK, we do not currently have the machinery, the know-how and the infrastructure and the markets and supply chains to actually scale up paludiculture into something that would be commercially attractive. So therefore, some challenges of this option would include the issue of water availability. Paludiculture requires the soil to be wet at all times, and we have seen some extreme droughts in recent years. So this is where the climate impacts are coming back to bite us. Um, some of these scenarios of peatland rewetting may not be sustainable because we don't get enough rainfall anymore in the summer. They require also some suitable machinery and management, and so there's quite heavy capital investment maybe that's required to change to a paludiculture system. So there's a financial burden on farms who want to get, get into paludiculture. And there is a potential displacement of food crops and lower income to farmers if the market prices are not the same as there would be for vegetables and for potatoes, which are quite high value crops. There are some potential food crops that can be grown under paludicultural systems, and those include bilberries, celery, cranberry, nettle, sedge grains, sweet grass grains, watercress or water pepper. In the image here we see um, a sphagnum farm, farming experiment. So a sphagnum is a moss that grows naturally in natural peatlands, uh, but stops growing as soon as the peat is being drained. Um, and this can be grown commercially. Um, I've seen some interesting examples actually at a Fenland soil conference last year that I went to in April, um, where uh, some companies are experimenting what to do with this moss and are turning this into products like insulating material for clothing, for example, or for bedding. But of course, it does not yet have the market to sell it on an industrial scale, and it, it's not getting the same prices like crops. So paludiculture is being experimented with, and there are some funds available for those of you who might be interested in participating in this. The University of Cambridge actually um, has held a workshop last year to help farmers take advantage of that fund and to identify possible demonstration projects, what can be done. So all these different options, the partial revetting or full revetting or the paludicultural systems raise the question, what is the optimal water table depth of peatland that we should be aiming for? And there's been an um, agenda setting paper in nature some time ago um, that was called Overriding Water Table Control on Managed Peatland Greenhouse Gas Emissions. So this paper found the water table depth actually is what drives the greenhouse gas emissions. If the peatland is very wet, you get lots of methane emitted, CH4. And if it's very dry, you get lots of carbon dioxide or CO2 emitted. So we can take those two main greenhouse gases from peatlands and we can get to the net greenhouse gas balance, which is the black line here. The green line increases in a linear fashion with the water table depth. So the deeper or the lower down in the soil the water table depth is, the higher the carbon dioxide emissions become. And the methane emissions are actually this brown line that sort of starts very high for wet soil where the water table is on the surface or even above the surface. And then the methane emissions fall initially and go down to almost zero at about 30 centimeters water table depth below the surface of the soil. If we take the methane and the carbon dioxide together, the net greenhouse gas balance is the black line here. And that shows that actually this is the lowest, actually below zero. So that means the soils are taking up more greenhouse gases from the atmosphere than they are emitting at about 10 centimeters water table depth. So 10 centimeters water table depth would be ideal purely from a greenhouse gas balance point of view. But it would mean basically most farming systems would not 
be able to operate on that land, it would be too wet. What we can also see here is that actually, if we go down to 20 centimeters, it's still a pretty good outcome in, compared to, in comparison to the one meter water table depth that we currently got. And even going from the very high point here at one meter or 100 centimeters water table depth, going to 90, 80, 70, depending on how high we can raise it and still grow crops on the, on the land, actually, we can reduce our emissions already. And I just want to highlight one project that we are currently working on at the University of Leicester. We are developing digital twins for sustainable land management for peatlands. I won't go into the details of this. This is a slide from one of our computer science colleagues. Uh, but it basically shows that a digital twin is a computer-based simulation of a physical twin or the real world system. So the physical twin would be our peatland field that is being used, for example. And that evolves over time, going from the left-hand side of this chart for time zero to time two, time four, and it evolves over time. As the physical system changes, the digital twin takes data and observations from the instrumentation and from land surface models into the computing model and provides information that then can feed back into those land use systems and can be used to improve the decision-making for example, on the choice of crops, on the choice of the timing of um, the raising of the water table in winter or the lowering of the water table in summer. And it can help with some other information that can then feed back on farming decisions or land use decisions in a real time kind of environment. So this project is still ongoing, but we will be looking to engage more widely on the initial outcomes from this project in the next year. What I see as the way forward for agriculture on lowland peatland is we need to move towards realizing the core benefits of multifunctional landscapes. Landscapes are already multifunctional. They deliver multiple different things, but we need to think about all these things and not just one of them. The net zero agenda is a very important policy agenda to get a handle on climate change and avoid catastrophic climate change that then also destroys farming in the region. So net zero is necessary, I think, as a country, uh, but there is a question actually, how, how can we do this in a way that maximizes benefits, for example, to biodiversity, to social, economic and health of our citizens. And therefore we need to think about all the multi multiple functions that landscapes provide. There will be some trade-offs which means we might be losing some of those functions or ecosystem services to create others, but there will also be benefits of those changes. And co-benefits of climate action can be realized for nature and for people. So we might move into a situation where we have better access to nature, better access to green spaces, attractive landscapes that still provide livelihoods and um, farming systems where uh, people can be confident that these are actually making a positive contribution on all the different factors, including the greenhouse gas emission balance in, in this way. So I believe we can get there, we can achieve it, but it does require for everyone to work together on finding scenarios how we can do this in a good way. And I should signpost to you the Land Use for Net Zero program, um, or LUNS for short, this is a new program that is co-led by my colleague, Professor Leanne Sutherland at the James Hutton Institute in Aberdeen and myself at the University of Leicester. And a number of additional research grants will be awarded around April this year. Um, UK Research and Innovation, DEFRA, the Department for Energy Security, Net Zero, and the Scottish Government, Welsh Government, and DERA in Northern Ireland are all putting money towards it. And there is 24 million pounds of research and policy relevant evidence provision um, will be happening in the next four years or so to support the transition of land use towards net zero. So watch this space for further news as the program unfolds. Thank you very much for your attention. I want to leave some time for discussion. Um, the QR code on the slide you see there is a link to our website for the Institute for Environmental Futures, where you can sign up to our quarterly external newsletter if you're interested. Um, 
And you can also use that um, to get information on other webinars or events that we are organizing. Thank you. Thanks, Heike, that's brilliant. Are you able to stop sharing your screen? That would be great. Brilliant, thank you so much. That was really succinct and um, yeah, really interesting. We've got a few questions coming in. Um, I just wanted to pick up on one from somebody called Alan, um, and he might have posted this before, um, before you moved on to this particular slide, but he's asking about are there other far forms of agriculture that would still be viable in rewetted peatlands? So I'm wondering if, um, I know you sort of touched on that with um, polluticulture, but I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about that and um, particularly how the farmers you were talking to about this, like what was, you know, how did they receive that? What were their sort of thoughts on polluticulture and the, the viability of it? Mm. Yeah, I think I highlighted when I talked about polluticulture, I highlighted some of the barriers to it. And the farmers I've spoken to about this as an option um, are environmentally very aware of the environmental footprint of the farming practices currently, but are also very nervous about the financial environment that they're operating in. So we have to be mindful that with the cost of living crisis, with the disruptions to supply chains, with all the uncertainties in economic terms, you know, what's going to happen with the economy and, and in exports and so on, um, it is a really thorny issue at the moment to talk about big changes where it's unclear how we're going to get there, where we want to be and how we're going to make that transition. And for a lot of farmers, I think what I have picked up on is a lot of farmers want some stability, they want some long term vision and some long term direction and some stable financial incentives that still allow them to farm and maintain their identity as a farmer and the livelihood from farming that doesn't entirely rely on state subsidies, um, where they feel like they're making a positive contribution to the economy and are not being subsidized for doing nothing or subsidized for just protecting the soil. Thank you. So there's, I'll just pick up on a question from Rob Wise from the NFU then. I don't know if you can expand on what you've just said a bit. So Rob is asking, can you describe the part of your research involving the farmers? What did you ask them and what did they mm. say? Um, I don't know if there's anything that you can add to what you've just said. Yeah. So we've, so I should say, let me rewind slightly on this. So I should say the what I've just said comes out of individual discussions I've had with farmers. It's not been a systematic research on farmers. What we have also done um, as part of the AI for Net Zero, Artificial Intelligence for Net Zero project, um, is we have done a survey uh, with a sample of 400 farmers or so in the UK. Um, that was done by my colleagues in behavioral sciences. And that survey was more systematic um, and actually looked at the attitudes and behaviors towards net zero, uh, particularly, and land use for net zero. But those have not been written up and published yet, so watch this space. It's going to come out as a paper. Um, there are some interesting findings that will come out. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so I know everyone, a lot of people are putting questions in the chat, but if you can please put them in the Q&A, that'd be good, because it's, it's not very easy to follow otherwise. Um, so something from Ian Davis here, um, this is a more science sort of technical one. Uh, the analysis of the optimum water depth for climate impact, i.e. 10 centimetres, is a key one for this issue. But I note from the paper quoted, the comparison used GWP um, 100 for both CO2 and methane. How would it change the assessment if, um, if methane was assessed using GWP star? Is that, do you, is that something you're able to answer, do you think, Heiko? Or... Um, so that is an interesting question. I would have to look up exactly how those calculations were made. It's not something I can answer from the top of my head. Yeah, no worries. Thank you for pointing that out. That's an interesting comment. Yeah. Um, if, I mean, if anyone has any thoughts on that and they want to put them in the chat, please do feel free. Um, so there was there was a question earlier on, which I actually can't find, but it was in the chat and it was re related. It was quite an interesting one it was related to um, how does the methane and the sort of um, and um, I guess or just CO2 equivalent at the moment compare to when peatlands were just just wetlands, just naturally, mm -hmm. you know, how does how do the emissions now compare to then? Yeah. 
So what we do now is if peatlands are left in their natural condition, which is a wetland essentially, then they are taking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they are emitting methane to the atmosphere. So it would depend on the weather in those areas where the peatland is located, or how much rainfall they receive and um, the seasonality of the drying cycle, for example, if it gets very dry in the summer or not, what the balance of this would be. So there isn't a number I can give you on this. Um, but we do know that the overall greenhouse gas emissions would have been lower than they are currently on the drained peat. Um, and partly you can see this because the thickness of the peat on those drained agricultural peatlands is reducing because the carbon is being lost to the atmosphere. So in natural peatlands, actually, they accumulate carbon and they grow in thickness, so they store carbon in the soil. And therefore, peatlands can be a sink of carbon overall. They can help us actually mitigate climate change. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, there's one here from Hassan at the James Hutton Institute. Did you also consider the role of peat extraction? Um, or were you only looking at agricultural use of peatlands? Or is that anything that you that you know about at all, Heiko? We did not consider peat extraction. We considered just the agricultural use of lowland peatlands. Uh, peat extraction um, is a practice that is on the way out, I think it's fair to say. Um, and um, yeah, that's a different story. But yeah, it's, it was about what do we do in those particular complex land use systems. So we were interested in the Agri-Food for Net Zero Network in complex problems that don't have an easy answer. And this was one of them. I think in the case of peat extraction, we just have to say, okay, we need to stop it. We know that. Um, but in the case of lowland peatland farming, it's a lot more complex because we have to consider the impacts on people, on the economy, on food security, and on the greenhouse gas balance of those peatlands. There's also a couple of questions here from um, two different people. Um, asking about the, the potential for regenerative farming on peatlands and if there is any potential there to, I, I guess, sequester carbon through different production methods in that sort of sense. Yeah. Regenerative farming definitely can make a positive impact. And one of the key things that I know currently, there's a lowland peatland task force um, that published a report recently with a number of recommendations. You can find this on, I think it might be on the DEFRA website or some somewhere on the government website, .gov.uk. The Lowland Peatland Task Force published a number of recommendations, I think something like 15 or so. Um, and they include, for example, recommendations how financial incentives could be made available under the Peatland Code um, and under some other financial instruments to get private investment into those farming systems. So it is quite possible that that could play a role in it. Mm, okay. Um, question here from uh, Dave Gibbon. Uh, see, when I first visited um, these areas in the 1960s, and I know Dave used to be a professor at UEA, um, I was told because of the oxidization of the peat following drainage that the total area available to farm was shrinking and the area of productive peat soils would eventually disappear. Is this still true? That is still true, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that kind of follows on. There's another question from someone asking about the potential for um, uh, shifting vegetable and salad production to other parts of the UK and what, what the potential there is, essentially. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the lowland peatland areas are producing something like 30 or 40 percent of vegetables and potatoes, but not all, you know. So it is possible to grow them on other soils, but they are not as productive. Therefore, it is possible to displace the crop production into other areas and the vegetable and potato production in particular, but then you would not get the same yields. And of course, what's also not possible is you cannot locate farmers who are currently farming in the fence into other areas and say, okay, so we're going to take your farm, turn it into wetland, and we're going to give you some farmland elsewhere because A, there isn't any farmland going spare. All the farmland is owned, all the land is in some ownership form. And B, you cannot just, uh, it's one of the char characteristics of the farming sector, basically, you cannot just take like a factory and replace it with a factory elsewhere. Sure. With manufacturing, I think that is quite often done. Manufacturing companies close a factory down and open a new one elsewhere, but you can't do that as a farmer. Mm -hmm. So that model would not really work very well. 
Mm. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about um, the alternative crops that you looked at as well. And because I think when we previously talked about this, you, you were talking a lot about um, the issues around sort of market development and infrastructure and processing. It was like you say, I mean, those sorts of things would have to be developed and like farms, they're not necessarily things that are just readily available for these different alternative crops. You know, how um, how realistic is it to sort of really look at polluticulture and, and these different crops that we might not be really big consumers of at the moment? Yeah. On the polluticulture side, I think there are particular types of polluticulture, I think, where the supply chains are currently just not there. And it would require actually creating a supply chain and demand for the products. So that has to come in parallel with the development of farming systems and the demonstration of those farming systems and how they work in practice. And they would go hand in hand because you have to be able to demonstrate that this can be grown economically. It's, it's viable as commercial model for farms. And at the same time, you have to persuade industry that there is a market for it and they can turn it into a product that makes them a profit and where there's a demand from consumers. So there are many different steps, I think, that need to be done. And the government funding for those polluticulture schemes is partly aiming to de-risk the whole transition towards possible polluticultural systems by enabling the demonstration of how this could be done in practice. Mm, yeah, so like you said, lots of different things have to kind of fit into into place for all of this. Like how how open were the the farmers that you talked to? How open were they to that idea of different crops? Was it something they were already looking at, or what were their kind of feelings on it? Well, I mean, a farmer is not a farmer, you know. So we there are many different people, and the people have different attitudes. It's a lot of farmers are very environmentally aware. A lot of farmers are also very aware of the impacts climate change already makes on their farming practices. Uh, so farmers are the ones who are spending a lot of time outdoors. You know, they can feel the heat in the summer. They can see how dry the fields are. They see their crops fail. Um, and and so therefore it's, it's in their minds. You know, they're worried about climate change impacts and what that means for their farm economy. So there is a high level of environmental awareness, I find, in the farming community. Um, but there is also, I think, skepticism around uh, the current policy environment that is operating, especially relating to agriculture and farming. So we would be very keen to discuss this in more depth, actually, with various different stakeholder organizations. If you're in the audience and you want to discuss this, please do contact me in person as well. And um, we will land use for Net Zero Hub. We are planning some stakeholder engagement events um, where we can uh, get in touch with you on this. Um, it would be, yeah, I would say, it, it would be a, a spectrum of different opinions on this. So some farmers are quite happy with the way they operate currently. Um, some farmers recognize the need for changing their land use practices, but actually don't know quite how they can make that change happen and what a good change would look like. It is quite hard because you're, it's like everybody, you know, we go about our day to day lives, but actually if somebody comes to us and says, oh, can't use your car anymore from tomorrow or next year or whenever, that's not a good message, you know, how, how do we replace that? So th there are immediate questions about if if something stops, what comes next? And how do you make that change from where, what you're doing now to this new kind of way of doing things? And we find some farmers, especially um, in the NFU uh, community, we have found a lot of farmers actually make voluntary pledges of climate-friendly farming practices and regenerative agriculture. On the NFU website, there's a lot of examples how that can be done. Um, and there's a lot of willingness to try things. We've seen some very interesting examples of farm clusters and networks of farmers. Fenland soil is one of these examples where farmers talk to each other on a regular basis about actually how is it like, you know, what can we do uh, differently and, and how do we improve the, the way we farm? How do we make this economically viable, environmentally friendly? Um, and maintain the cultural identity of farmers in the fence because, you know, it's not just about the environment it's about people yeah no interesting point thank you um want to pick up then there's a question here from somebody called uh chris here from feedback um who is saying um kind of making the point you know a lot of what we grow in east anglia isn't for direct human consumption is there an argument for maximizing nutri nutritional output in the fens um and deprioritizing um crops such as i mean uh, saying like sugar beet for example yeah, 
Well, interestingly, sugar beet is one of these crops that actually has a better carbon footprint than other crops, you know, because it takes up a lot of carbon from the atmosphere and stores it as sugar in, in the beet. And, and therefore, um, there is a difference, I suppose, in what crop you grow, um, how much carbon that takes out of the atmosphere and how much of it goes back from the peatland soil that's oxidizing. And it would be an interesting discussion to have, actually, what are possible crop rotation systems that would work that actually reduce the greenhouse gas emissions while still producing. So I would say it's not so much about do we eat it or do we not eat it. It's it's actually more about what is the greenhouse gas balance like. Um, and in the case of sugar beet, um, that may be an interesting one because actually, we, you know, we could turn this into sugar. We can feed it to animals. We can do different things with it. Um, so there, there are questions around how we use the crops that we produce. Yeah, thank you. Um... So I guess so following on from that, really, there's a question here from um, an anonymous person um, talking more about, um, I guess, the kind of more of the decisions that we make on, on what we what we use the land for. So have you considered options for some combination of partial rewetting and alternative land use, for example, solar farms? So we've not considered solar farms for peatlands. Um, as a way of using the land. Um, and we've not gone to the level of detail of actually thinking about, well, where could we do what? Um, so it was a workshop that basically focused on laying out a possible pathway towards getting to solutions. But actually, we've not been able to solve the whole problem in this one workshop. Um, it is still some ongoing uh, research activity in the University of Cambridge and in some other initiatives, including in the artificial intelligence project here at the University of Leicester. Um, where we are looking at, well, how can we help the, trans the transition and how we can help the, the decision-making processes involved in it. Um, but it's not the end of the line. In East Anglia, of course, it's also complicated by the internal drainage board structure because the drainage boards are the organizations that basically maintain the water table depths by pumping the groundwater out into the sea. And so it's not something the farmers can control very easily. You can block your drainage ditches to make it better, you know, but actually there's a very limited impact of this if the, the inter internal drainage boards are maintaining the water level um, to keep the place dry. Mm. So it would need um, it would need quite a sophisticated political solution, I think, to think about how we can manage this. And because it is a highly regulated environment we're in, the water cycle in the in East Anglia is highly regulated. How do we actually change this very carefully? And not tamper with it in a bad way um, to get us onto the track we need to get onto. Mm. So it sounds like, like you say, a bit more of a political kind of solution that's got a real sort of strategy behind it. Yeah, um, it takes a multi stakeholder solution, not just policy in the sense of DEFRA, but yeah. actually multi stakeholder by talking to everyone who has an interest in it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I get there's a question here from somebody called Alan. Um, that's also about, I guess, the con controlling of the water levels a bit more. Um, could Heiko say more about how partial uh, re-wetting or just re-wetting would interact with changing precipitation patterns? Would it even be possible to keep water tables high throughout the year? And I guess that goes back to the point you were making earlier about the difficulty in summer, but then also, is there a way of actually doing it with these other stakeholders kind of involved? Yeah. Now, there are two arguments that can be made. The first one can be made to say, well, actually, rewetting re won't work because the summers are getting so dry that rewetted peatlands are going to dry out each summer and then start oxidizing anyway, even if we stop producing food. The other argument can be that actually by raising the water table and maintaining it at a higher level, we are becoming more resilient to the drought impacts when they happen. If the ground is wetter overall, then we are maybe storing more water in the soil and we are less vulnerable to these very dry summers that we are likely to get more often. The UK Climate Impact Programme has for a long time published forecasts, actually, that I've seen for the last 15 years or so. You know, so this is not new. Uh, we've, we've known this from the climate modelers. They've told us this a long time ago. Um, that basically we are expecting drier summers, hotter summers in the UK, and we're expecting wetter and windier winters. Um, so it's a question, how do we balance the water usage and the water storage between the winter and the summer? The water companies are 
already on this. So I know Anglian Water and some other water companies are already thinking about how to adapt the water management to deal with that change in the seasonality. Um, but it would be a very interesting thing to also think about, would it make my farming systems more resilient if, for example, the water table was at 70 centimeters and not one meter below the surface? And it might actually reduce the emissions. So it might solve multiple different problems. It might reduce the carbon footprint of a farm. It may be incentivized by a government scheme like the peatland code um, financially, um, and it might still enable the production of crops um, and actually make farming more resilient to those very dry, hot summers. Mm. Did you look at all um, at policy mechanisms that might be able to help with this that aren't, that aren't sort of being looked at at the moment at all? Or, or perhaps like what is already being offered and how, whether that, how, to what extent it works, doesn't work? Not in enough detail, I have to say. So this is still work that's ongoing. Um, and I know it's also discussions ongoing in government um, where there's a lot of thinking going into actually how farming subsidies can change and how financial instruments can change to allow green finance to flow into the, the land use sector and farming. Um, we are looking at this in our green finance um, topic advisory group in the Land Use for Net Zero Hub as one of the activities um, how can we basically get private finance to pay for part of this net zero transition in, in a good way? Some of the instruments we have talked about is the peatland code, which is maybe the more operational developed code. And under the peatland code, you can already be incentivized for raising the water table and rewetting peatland. Um, that's an established mechanism how to do this. There is the sustainable farming incentive and there are the environmental land management schemes and various other instruments that have just come out um, these are sl somehow slightly different, I think, in the devolved administrations. I know less about that. Um, but there are similar mechanisms, I think, being tried in, in the different nations. Do you know if there are any best practices that we can learn from elsewhere around the world where, you know, countries have significant um, sort of peatlands like us? Is, is, you know, what's, what's being done around the world? Is that something that you've looked at at all? We have looked at international studies of peatland. What we have found is even if peatland has been drained for a very long time, as soon as you start rewetting it, it can become a carbon sink again. Um, okay. So we know from other experiments, actually, that it's never too late. You can still turn a, a wasted peatland back into a functioning peatland that takes up carbon and starts growing again and accumulating carbon in the soil. Um, but there are, to my knowledge at least, Apart from some pilot studies that are being done, I've not seen an industrial scale application of a net zero compliant farming system on drain peatland so far. Okay. We know how to reduce the emissions. I haven't seen a functioning system that is fully net zero on those peatlands, but that may not be where we need to be. I don't know. I mean, I'm asking the question, I suppose. We can reduce the carbon footprint that gets us towards net zero as a nation. Agriculture and land use is not the only sector. I've shown in my first slide, actually, the energy consumption is one of the biggest or the biggest emitter, actually, of greenhouse gases in the UK. And we need to move towards net zero overall. It's not just the land use and agriculture. Are there any, um, I wonder if you could end on the sort of key areas that you think that still need looking at in terms of peatland management and the whole sort of decision making around it, you know, what are the sort of the really big kind of gaps there, do you think, that need to be looked at most urgently? I think the key question for me would be how interventions and subsidy schemes can be set up in a way that are attractive to farmers, in the sense that they are enabling collaboration and co-working of farmers in incentives like the you know farm clusters and initiatives like maybe sharing some new equipment you have to purchase something like this so the, the sort of getting out of the loneliness i think is is important so if incentives can actually help bring farmers together and collaborate i think that would be one incentive i would like to see more of and i know a lot of people would like to see that um Farmers in many parts of the UK, if not everywhere, are already talking to each other a lot, of course, and are organized in the NFU and some other organizations. So, it, But it can be good, actually, to think about how can we incentivize 
change, not just at the farm level, but actually maybe at the regional level, especially when we talk about peatlands. So that would be maybe on my wish list to think about um, how we can come up with something like this. Near Leicester, where I work, um, we have the Allerton project. That is a very good example where that can uh, work. Um, we've been working with that project for a number of years um, and looked at benefits and trade-offs of some land use interventions, especially things like tree planting along river courses uh, to um, improve the water quality and things like this, where it's clear that some land use interventions actually can deliver multiple benefits. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we're going to leave it there, but thank you so much for your presentation and answering all those questions. We've had so many questions. I think we had almost, I don't know, I think probably like 40 questions through there, through the chat and the Q&A and everything. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and um, we'll be making we'll be making this video available on YouTube afterwards for anybody who wants to wants to catch up because there's a lot of a lot of information in there. So if you want to watch it back, um, then just look out for an email from us in the next next few days or so. Um, so our next webinar is called Methane Muck and Money. Are we missing a trick with manure? Um, so new research suggests the scale of UK methane emissions may be higher than first thought but also that better management could significantly reduce this, while technology could harness emissions to generate energy and income. So um, my colleague Neil, who's on the call, he may have seen in the background, um, Neil um, is gonna be presenting on that, along with Professor Andy Atkins from the International Fugitive Emissions Abatement Association, and that will be on April the 12th at 11 a.m. Um, I'll be putting out a link for that fairly shortly. So. Um, do do look out for that and if you're not if you're not when you when you signed up for this um for this uh this event bright if you didn't check that you wanted to be added to our list then uh, maybe you want to you want to do that um or else look out for it on social media um in the meantime you can also browse our back catalog on youtube of um previous uh, webinars if you missed any and um, we also welcome any comments and suggestions for speakers um, and, and sort of topic areas, if you have any. So you can either email myself or Neil. Um, and I think Neil, if you could put those, um, those links in the chat again, just for everybody, that'd be really helpful. Um, but yeah, thank you, Heiko. And we will um, thank you everybody for coming. And um, yeah, thanks very much. We'll see you again soon, hopefully. Thanks. Thank you, Jess, and thank you, everybody, for the nice discussion and all the questions you've asked. Brilliant, thanks. Neil, if you can stop recording, that'd be great.